Okay, now we're going to begin Unit 8, Property Rights, Estates and Tenancies, Condominiums, Cooperatives, and Time Sharing. Okay, so you're going to have 8% of the examination on this section. So about eight questions on the exam for the state. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is define land, real estate, and real property. What is that, right? So land is the surface and everything attached to it by nature. And it, it contains the earth, it goes to the earth's center to infinity. Like it's that area down, right? That's the land. Real estate is, is uh, land and any human made improvements that are attached to the land. So that would be a garage, a house, a shed, a, a, a concrete driveway, like anything that you approve or anything that you add to it would be real estate. And then real property would be the real estate plus the bundle of legal rights. And I'm going to explain to you what that is in a minute. So definition of real property, Florida statute 475 describes real property or real estate means any interest or estate in land and any interest in business enterprises or business opportunities. It includes mineral rights. Okay, it does not include cemetery lots, renting of mobile home lot or recreational lots, uh, vehicle lots in a mobile home park or a travel park. Okay, so cemetery lots and mobile homes and, and recreational lots are not included in real property as per Florida statute. So what's the physical components of land? Okay, so one, you have surface rights. Okay, that includes land and water rights. Okay, so there's two types of water rights. Okay, so you have riparian rights and littoral rights. You need to know that. You need to know the difference. Okay, so riparian rights are like rivers and streams. They flow. Littoral rights are non-flowing. That's like being uh, up against a lake or the ocean right? Because the ocean is not flowing. The rivers and the streams, the creeks, they flow. So think about it. Riparian river flow. Littorial lake doesn't flow, right? That's how you can remember that. Riparian is a river. It moves, right? So riparian must move. The, land, the water moves. Littorial is like a lake. A lake doesn't move. It just sits there. So that's how you can remember that. The ocean, the lake, right? Then you have subsurface rights. That's called mineral rights. That's like oil, gold, anything that's under the ground. That would be mineral rights. And then you have air rights. That involves the space above the property. So surface, subsurface, and air rights. So let's talk about the littorial versus riparian. Okay, so littorial rights are associated with the land abutting non-flowing bodies of water. So that's like a house on the ocean, a house on the Gulf, a house on the lake, okay? It's non-flowing water and that includes ponds and lakes. Riparian rights are associated with land abutting a flowing waterway. That would be a bank of a river or a stream or a creek, something that's flowing, okay? So let's look at some of the definitions that are associated with water rights. You need to know these, you'll see something about one of them. Okay, so you have accreation. Okay, accreation is the process of land build up from waterborne rock, sand, and soil. You also have something called alluvion. Now, you can't have alluvion unless accreation happened. So, accreation is the build up of the land from the waterborne rock and sand and soil. And then, alluvion would be the new deposits resulting from that accreation. So when the, the water brings the land, the soil, like the soil comes, it builds up a mound. That's accreation. Alluvion is the actual mound. Does that make sense? Um, can you repeat that? Maybe. So you have water that's flowing okay. and it's bringing rocks and dirt with it, right? And then in, on the side, it's building a mound of, of dirt, right? A mound, a mound is happening. So accreation is the process of it bringing the dirt causing the mound to happen. And then the mound is actually called alluvion. Mm. So accreation is creating the alluvion. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so uh, a creation is, is more like a creation is more like the current that's that's bringing the alluvion, which happens to be the process, mound. Yeah, it's the process of it. Yep. Oh. Okay. And when it happens, it's called alluvion. That's the result of the accretion. Gotcha. Okay. And then you have erosion. We all know what erosion is. When a hurricane comes, it takes the beach out, right? It, re it removes the land. It removes the beach. Beach erosion, right? Mm. And then you have reliction. You need to know that one. I've had that on mine. Reliction is the receding of the water. And it uncovers new land. So if, if water recedes and it makes new land that was once covered by water. So mm. think, reliction, recede. Right? Reliction, recede. Yeah. And that uncovers additional land. You need to know the difference of those. Just remember, accretion and alluvion work together. Erosion is when it goes away. Reliction is when it recedes and it brings under, uncovering additional land. Okay? We'll go over that okay. a little more in the review. Okay. So now we have to look at two different types of property. Okay? We have real property and we have personal property. Okay. There's two different types of property. So two basic types, the real property is realty and the personal property is known as chattel. You need to know that term. Chattel is personal property. Okay. You need to know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, personality indicates the personal property. So, Real property can become personal property by the act of severance. And personal property becomes real property by attachment. So let me give you an example. You buy a ceiling fan at Home Depot. It's personal property. It's in a box, right? You take it out of the box and you connect it to the house and you install it. Now it becomes real property because it's connected to the house. Oh, okay. Right? So... The fan was personal property when you bought it. The minute you connect it, it becomes it becomes real property. It's connected to the house as part of the sale, right? Unless you say it's not. A no. washer and dryer. You buy a washer and dryer, it's personal property. You take it to the house and you connect it. Now it's real property. Gotcha, gotcha. With solar right. panels being there as well? What's that? Solar panels? Solar panels would be, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Once it's attached, it's, it's, it's real property. Yeah. Okay. Yep, sure. So personal real property is the realty that goes with it. So when you have a house for sale and there's a washer and dryer connected, if that washer and dryer is not going with the house, you must say not included. Right? Gotcha. If you don't say that, it's included. And that people sue over that and all kinds of things. You know. Mm. So you got to make sure, you know, that's more when you're an agent. And I'll I mean, as you go, you'll you'll see how that works. You always yeah. got to disclose on the on the agreements and in the listings and stuff yep okay it's like the generator hookup for the house we have listed now we had to just show that and say it wasn't staying well the, the hookup staying but the generator the the soft flow the soft start and the and generator's not right mm. right okay so let's look at fixtures okay now you know real property versus personal property right that makes sense yes mm -hmm. so now you have fixtures Okay, fixture was original with personal property, now permanently attached to, to be made part of the real property. And there's four tests to what a fixture is in court. Like this is what they'll look at. What are the intent of the parties about that item? So if you have a listing and you put in a listing agreement and you put in the listing language, washer and dryer not included, chandelier not included. That's the intent of the party, right? It's, it's intended mm -hmm. not to be included. Mm -hmm. the relationship or the agreement of the parties. Well, if the, if the buyer and seller know it's not included, they agree, right? Method or degree of attachment. If it's a washer and dryer, you cook, you take it off easy, right? If it's furniture that's built into the wall and if you take it out and it's going to make a big mess. Now you can't really take that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm just using an example yeah. and adaption of the item. Is it easily adapted? Can it be replaced? If you're, for example, you buy a $20,000 chandelier in your dining room. Okay. You don't, you, that's not included. So you're going to take that chandelier out and put the original one back in. You're not going to leave a hole in the wall, right? You can't do that. Got it. So you have to, you know, is it adaptable? Can you take it out? Is it going to be a problem? Right. 
a microwave that's built into the wall or a microwave that's on the counter. There's a difference, right? The counter, mm -hmm. you don't plug it and take it. The one yeah. on the wall, you got to put another one in a plate. You can't tear it out of a wall, right? Yeah. So that that that's that's how you look at this, right? Does that make sense? Yes. However, um, who is the one that judges that? Like, the, how does how does that the come? Seller, to the seller is going to tell you, I'm I'm not leaving this. I'm taking this, and you're going to put that in the listing agreement. Okay. And you're gonna put that in the in the listing on the market under the broker remarks. Washer and dryer not included. A chandelier being replaced with the original. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're going to put that in there as long as it's communicated because that's the intent of the seller. Now, the buyer can say, okay, I agree. Or the buyer can say, no, I want the chandelier and I'll give them $10,000 for it. And then yeah. they can negotiate. But you have to have the intent. If you put a house up on the market and you have a washer and dryer and all that stuff and you don't say it's included or not, it's included because it's, 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 it's real. It's, uh, it's, it's there. It's connected. Yeah, yeah, it's real property. Real prop, and if you don't tell them that it's not included, it's assumed to be included. Got it. You see, so that's very important when it comes to legality, because if they want to take it and you didn't put that in there, now you got a problem. Okay, and and would it also be a problem if they just take it out and leave yes. just the hole because in there? The buyer can sue them. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. I had a situation where I sold the house in Boca Raton and the guy took all the, all the kitchen appliances out and put cheap ones in. Never told me, never told anybody. Mm -hmm. The buyer sued him for it because there was all new appliances and that's what they expected to get. They bought the house. They went there for the walkthrough and he put, he took them out and put other appliances in. And they were like, what's going on here? So they, ended, they still bought the house, but they filed a lawsuit against him. Mm -hmm. you know, he basically didn't disclose it. And it had nothing to do with me. I didn't know either. I'm like, I called him up. Like, what are you doing, man? Like, what happened? You know? Mm -hmm. And he told me the dishwasher broke, so he just replaced everything. But he lied. I mean, it was obviously secondhand equipment. It was nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. But people do stupid things, right? Yep. Um, question for him. Uh -huh. Is there an acronym that's been, that's been made there? Like with the IRMA? Is that, like, does that make up something? Well, you can IRMA. The intent, mm -hmm. the relationship, the method, and the adaption. Okay. Remember, er, that's one of the acronyms. In the end, in the review, I have all the acronyms for you, like for this. But if you want to know what the four tests are for a fixture, IRMA, okay, is the acronym mm -hmm. for it. Okay. okay. So let's, let's look at a comparison here, okay? Now you have fixtures and you have something called trade fixtures, okay? So... Fixtures are like in residential property. Trade fixtures are in commercial property. Okay. So a fixture is real property. It's like a fan that you installed, right? It's a chandelier you put in. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's permanent. It's permanent property. It's in residential sales and it's included in a sale. A fixture is included in the sale. The fans are included. It's all included unless you say it's not included. Okay. A trade fixture it's personal property in a, in a business. It's removable. It's usually in a commercial lease and it's not included in the sale. So if you own a pizza shop and you have ovens and dough, dough machines, mixers and, and fryers and, and all that, that's personal property. That doesn't go with the sale unless you say it's in the sale. That's called a trade fixture. You see the difference? Yes. Well, what, what, what is a trade? Like, what, what, what is the word trade? trade a trade is like it's a business fixture. It's a business item. It's a mm. it's an, it's to operate a business. You know, they just call them trade fixtures. It, 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 trade is a trade is a work like the type of work you do. Right. A trade. Mm. So that's like, you know, pizza ovens, you know, stoves, things like that. I'm just using an example. Right. Okay. A doctor's office, that would be the trade. trade or a metal trade. It could be saws, it could be drills, presses, all stuff like that. Anything, anything that's that's used for the business. That would be called mm. a trade fixture. But they're personal property. That's not real property, right? In that yeah. situation. Even okay. even if they are attached to the property? Yeah, it's still personal property because it's it's a trade fixture. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, because the oven's attached, right? You have the vents, you have all the stuff mm -hmm. like yeah, so yep.
Okay, so now we're going to talk about property rights. Okay. And the acronym for the, for the property rights is Deep C. And when you have property and you own property, you have these basic property rights. Okay, so you have the disposition. You have the right to dispose of it. You want to tear it down, you can do that. You have the right of enjoyment. Okay, it's the right to use it. They call that quiet enjoyment. You can right to use your property. You have the right of exclusion. That means the right of preventing trespass. People can't just walk in your house and sit down and talk and hang out, right? You have possession. That means you have the right to occupy at any time you want. And you have control of it. The right to unlawful, uninterrupted use. People can't just say, get out of your house, right? You have the right to it. So deep C is your basic property rights. Okay. Now we're going to talk about estates and tenancies. Okay. Now, estates and tenancies, they're the degree and the quantity, nature, and extent of the interest of ownership rights. So when you own a property, the estates and the tenancies explain how you occupy it, how you own it, and what rights you have to the property, right? So there's two general groups of estates and tenancies, okay? You have freehold. So a freehold estate is an indefinite length and an unknown duration. That's when you buy a property. You buy it, you buy it today. You don't know when you're going to sell it. You own it. You can do whatever you want with it. And if you decide to sell it, you sell it. If you decide to give it to your kids or another person, you do that too. It's an, a freehold is an indefinite length, unknown duration. Do whatever you want. A leasehold estate is also called a non-freehold. And that's for a fixed known duration. Okay, now a leasehold estate, you own that period. So for example, you're renting an apartment for a year. Okay, you have a leasehold estate on that. So for that year, you have access to it. You don't own it. You own that year of it. So it's a leasehold. There's a known duration. You take it this day, you move out that day. So freehold is the owner, has the deed, has the house, does whatever they want with it as long as they want. Leasehold is the renter, is the tenant. And they have the lease for an amount of time. One year, five year, 10 year, if it's a business, you know, like whatever it is. Do you understand the difference of that? Yes. Okay. You need to know that. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the types of freehold estates. So you have freehold and leasehold. Now there's different types of freehold estates that you can hold the property in. Okay. So the ownership of a freehold estate, remember it's ownership interest for an indefinite period, unknown duration, as long as they want it. Right. And there's two types of freehold estates. You need to know these. You have a fee simple, okay? Fee simple is the largest bundle of rights. You can that's that that's what you want when you buy a property. You want fee fee simple, and it can be inherited. You can it can be inherited to you, and you can give it to others. That's a fee simple freehold estate, the largest bundle of rights. Just know that, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Then you have a life estate. Okay, a life estate is measured by a person's life. So if I have a property and I say, Aiden, you're going to have this property for the remainder of your life. And then after you, after you pass away, it's going to go to, it's going to come back to the trust or it's going to go to a charity. I name who it's going to go to. So Aiden can have that house. He can live in it. He can own it for a life estate. He can't sell it. He can't give it to nobody. He can't do anything except live in it for the rest of his life. Does that make yeah. sense what a life estate is? He does. Um, can they make modifications to the home? They can make modifications to the home. They just can't, they can't change ownership of it. Okay. So the only thing that they cannot change is the ownership, but if they want to change the roof, change the wall. They're going to have to change the roof because eventually it's going to break, right? Like, yeah. 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 You still got to maintain it. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Maintain it, remodel, and all that. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Got it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about fee simple. Okay, so fee simple is the most comprehensive coverage ownership. It's absolute and complete ownership. 
It can be inherited. Okay, it's, it's also referred to as fee or fee simple absolute. So if you hear fee simple or fee estate or fee simple absolute estate, it's all the same thing. Okay. Okay. And you have the power to use it, dispose of it, to send it to your heirs. You can do whatever you want with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a freehold estate. Now let's talk about the life estate or I'm sorry, that's the fee simple estate. Let's talk about the life estate. Okay. A life estate is created by the person who holds the fee simple title to the real property. So the person who owns the property can do what he wants with it, right? So the freehold estate is limited in duration to the owner's lifespan or other designated person's lifespan in a life estate. So it's still called a freehold, but it's it's limited as a life estate. So like I said, if I'm giving it to Aiden for the remainder of his life, and then it's going to go to a charity or it's going to go to another person. I may be dead, right, by that time. Yeah. So, so, it, so, so basically, it's either going to go to it's going to go to him, and then it will go to whoever I name it to after I'm dead. It'll it'll be already drawn out how it's going to happen, right? Yes. Okay. Well, so, but it was, but it would still be called the freehold state. Well, it's the, I own the freehold estate, even though Aiden has the life estate. Okay. I still own the freehold estate. Got you. And could you change your mind? Ah, uh, you know something? That's a really good question. I don't think so. Not in, not unless the person who has the life estate allows nice. you. To. Oh, allows you to. Okay. Or dies. They could allow you to, or they can die. Okay. So I, that's that's the point of a life estate. You probably you, you couldn't change your mind unless it was agreed to. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yep. So now, a conventional life estate is created by agreement of the parties. The grantor transfers the life estate to another. The grantor would be the freehold owner. The person mm -hmm. giving it is the grantor. I'm giving it to you, right? Got it. So that's how that works. Now, if they wanted it back, they'd probably have to agree and sign, or unless the person dies. You know. But the thing is, if you already named the next person that's going to get it, you yeah. would go again. So, you know. Yeah. It, it really, you know, depending on how it's legally drawn up. Now, if it was coming back to me after he dies, then, then yeah. it would come back to me, right? Yeah. Or my trust or my whatever, right? Yeah. But that's an example of that. That's a very good question. Yeah. It sounds like it would be a process to get that. To, to yeah. That that cycle. A lawyer would have to draw up a deed. Yeah. It's not something that you just go do. Right. Right. So a life estate creates two distinct ownership interests from the original fee simple estate. Possible persons who hold title once a life estate ends. So when that life estate ends and that person dies, there's two ways it can be done. It's called an estate in reversion. That's when it reverts to the original grantor. Okay, so let's say a person buys a house. They own the fee simple. They give their mother a life estate. She's 90 years old. She, she dies in five years. They just want her to have a house while she's living. She dies in five years. It goes back to the person who gave it to her. That's called a state in reversion. Okay. Got it. I, bu I buy a house. I give it to Aiden. I, I die. Aiden, Aiden passes away. I name it to go to a charity when he dies. That's called a remainder estate. And that goes to the charity. The charity will be called a remainder man. Got it. You need to know a so remainder man. You may see that. What's a remainder man, right? Remainder man. Sounds a remainder so man is who the estate goes to after the life estate ends. It's called a remainder estate, remainder man, right? Okay. Estate in reversion, it goes back to the person who gave it. That's the only two possibilities you have when you have a life estate. That makes sense? Yeah. Remainder man is the person that the person or or entity that gets the property or the real estate yep. um after the life estate ends. The, yeah, the life estate, okay. Yep. Good. And a state in reversion is when it goes back. It reverts back, right? Reversion. It reverts back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had I had a client one time 
that had a life estate and they wanted to sell the property and they couldn't like they wanted to list the property and sell it. And I couldn't because it was a life estate. Mm. It was a daughter of a guy and the guy, the guy died. The daughter wanted to sell it. She couldn't sell it because it was going to somebody else after she, after she died. Yeah. And she was angry. She was angry about it because she wanted to sell it, but there's not nothing you could do. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a legal life estate. Life estates can also be created by law. So for example, if, a, if, in, if there's a homesteaded property and it's titled in one spouse's name and they're married, by operation of law, the surviving spouse receives a legal life estate to the homesteaded property. So if you have a homestead, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, I'll explain homesteads to you. It's a legal protection that you get and there's tax benefits to it. So you have a homesteaded property. It's in just the sp one spouse's name. That spouse dies. The house automatically goes to the other spouse if it's in a homestead. That's through life estate. Okay. Now, for this reason, it, if, if a house, you're going to list the house and it's in a homestead and only one spouse has it in their name. Both spouses have to sign the, the listing agreement. Both, sign, both have to sign the contract. Both have to sign the closing docs and the deed because it's a life estate even though it's in one name because it's in a homestead, it turns it into a life estate because the other person has interest in it. They both have to sign. If it was a normal house, not in a homestead and it was just in one spouse's name, only that one spouse would have to sign. Mm -hmm. The exception is when it's in a homestead, you need to know that you may be questioned on that. Yeah. So if, if the property is homesteaded and I'll explain you. Don't worry. Just, just get in your head now. Don't, you don't have to remember exactly. I'm going to explain you how homesteading works. And there's math calculations to figure it all out. I'm going to teach you all that. So this is just get telling you, if it's in a homestead, both parties have to sign no matter whose name it's in. If it's not in a homestead, only the person whose name it is in has to sign. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just know that you. right now. Just know that right now. Don't worry about anything else. Okay. All right. Yeah. That makes sense though, right? You got that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if it's in a homestead, they both have to sign it. Right, everything, right? And then if it's not, if it's only in one, but that's only if it's in one name. If it's in both names, they both got to sign anyway, right? Makes, but makes if it's sense. in one name, they both got to sign in a homestead. If it's in one name outside of a homestead, they don't both have to sign. Just know that, just know that, okay? What are they, what are they signing for? What, what sell, the contracts, the, 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 list, the listing agreement, the contract, the deed, to sell the oh, house. Okay. Okay. Like if, if, if one spouse wants to sell it and the other does it and they're in a homestead, they can't sell it. But what if the property is meant to go to somebody else once they die? Well, it can't, if it's homesteaded, it goes to the spouse automatically. And I'll explain that to you later. Okay. So if you have a house and a homestead and you have, and you have a spouse, you can't give that house to somebody else. It becomes a life estate with the spouse. Gotcha. Okay. That's part of the part of the way it works. Yeah. All right. All right. So let's talk about homestead now. Okay. A homestead is the right to homestead the owner's permanent principal residence. Okay. And there's protections and benefits. Okay. It's protection of the family, the legal life estate. It protects your family, so that house can't be taken. Now, if you don't pay it, it can be taken in foreclosure. However, you can't be sued and your house be taken from you. Like if you have a lawsuit, somebody sues you, they can't take your house. You file bankruptcy, they can't take your house in a homestead. Got it. So an example of that is, remember when O.J. Simpson was found innocent? No. Okay, so O.J. Simpson was the, the football player. He was found innocent. There was a murder, his ex-wife. They thought he was guilty. You're, you're too young for that. So I was going to say we're the same age. You know, we're just a little bit before our time. Yeah. So O.J. Simpson, you know, everybody thought he killed. It was, it was the big thing, man, on TV every day, court. They had a glove. The glove didn't fit, so you must have quit. That's what the lawyer said. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so, so, um, so anyway, the, the family sued him for millions and millions of dollars. 
I can't believe you don't know. I can't like this is the first time I ever had this happen. <laughs> so, so he now not every state has homestead. New York has it. Florida has it. Not every state. So when you when he was found not guilty, he took all his money. He moved to Florida and he bought a mansion. That's O.J. Simpson. Do you know, oh, remember that's him putting the glove. Yeah. Oh, oh, all kinds of hand exercises and yeah, the glove didn't fit. So my dad's saying it's pretty interesting. And the gloves didn't fit. So if the gloves don't fit, you got to acquit. That's what the lawyer, Johnny Cochran, said. Mm, That's funny. (laughs) And that was one of the the clues, like the gloves didn't fit his hand. So how could it have been me, right? You know, like I wasn't, you know. So anyway, um, so he moved to Florida. He bought a mansion. They sued him for millions. He he can't, they can't get it. All his money's in the mansion. And that will go to his kids. Amen. You know, so that's an example of homestead it being used for a reason like that. So it protects the family. Uh, protect It protects the homestead from a forced sale, like those situations. Like I'm talking, they can't sue you and make you sell your house. You have a tax exemption up to $50,000. So it gives you a break on your assessment for your taxes up to 50,000. And there's some, there's some additional things that can be added, which we'll go over in a little bit. And, and there's definitely a question or two on your test about the calculations. 100% you're going to see questions. Okay. Size restriction of protected homestead is 160 acres outside the city or a half an acre within the city. And that's determined by where the land is zoned and by your tax map. So if it's outside the city, it's property of up to 160 acres. And in the city, it has to be on at least a half. It can't be on any more than a half acre. In the city, and personal property protection of a thousand dollars value. So there's personal property that it protects a thousand dollars value. Okay, so that's how the homestead works. Now, let's talk about the non-freehold or leasehold estates. So now we talked about the freehold estates, right? That's when you own it, you could do whatever you want with it. There's two types: fee simple is when you have all the rights to do what you want and life estate when you have it for a term, right? Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to estate and reversion or it goes to a remainder man, right? That's, Mm -hmm. that's freehold and freehold. When you own it, you have the homestead option. If you want to homestead it, if you qualify. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of that is freehold. Okay. Now we're going to talk about non freehold or leasehold estates. Okay, so leasehold estates or non-freehold are measured in calendar time. There's a known duration. You're you're taking the property January 1st. You're leaving December 31st, right? Next year, the end of the year. There's a known duration. You know when you're going to be there. Okay, it's non-freehold because it does not exist for an indefinite period, right? Freehold is unknown period, undetermined. It's up to you. Non-freehold means there's no indefinite period. It's already start and end dates in writing. Okay. They call it non-freehold or less than freehold because it's it's non-freehold, right? It's not like they they term, it depends how they want to ask the question. If you hear the word less than freehold and non-freehold, it means it's not freehold. That means it's a leasehold, right? It's all it's all the same terminology. There's no ownership interest. The owner does not transfer the ownership rights. They just transfer the estate time, the leasehold estate for that time. So the owner still owns the building, but the person leasing it has the rights to it for that time. Make sense? Got it. Okay, so they transfer the right of enjoyment, which is use and possession for that period of time. Mm. Okay, that's what's being transferred, the use and the possession. Question for you. So is that is that the same case with like um, let's say there's a restaurant and they have a lease for like let's say twenty years, yep. and then they they only are in business for like let's say five, 
and they, yep. they, they sell, you know, the property and let's say they sell the equipment as well. Well, they, they wouldn't sell the property because they don't own the property. They would yeah, sell yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. But, 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 they would, but, but they would, let's say, sell their personal items that are in the property. They so could. They, you know, the ovens and all that. Yeah, they could do that. But in What would that be? Sell, that, would, that would be what? Trade fixtures, right? Yeah, that would be trade right. fixtures. So let, I'm trying to use that in your conversation. So you start to. That, and I like it. I like it. I was looking for it. But, man, that was two seconds. Ago. But okay. anyways. Um, but they, they could also, or they could also know, but they will also, including the sale, the 15 years remaining that they have of well, that property. They would have to. And the mm-hmm. landlord would have to approve it. Gotcha. They can't just do it. The landlord would have to say, okay, I'll take them. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Right. They would they would take over that lease, right. And this, and this is, and this is what, what he's talking about by, by transfer rights of enjoyment, I guess. Well, well, no, no. What I'm saying, tra- the transfer of the right of the enjoyment was from the owner to the tenant. Now, if the tenant sells it to another person, then the owner has to approve it. Yeah, but you're transferring okay. the use of it, the enjoyment. They're using it for whatever they want, right? Okay. Whatever it's agreed, okay. right? Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Good. So now let's talk about the types. So you remember, freehold estates had fee simple and leasehold, right? Now, non-freehold estates have three types. You have estate for years, tenancy at will, and tenancy at sufferance. So estate for years, tenancy at will, and tenancy at sufferance. So let's look at estate for years. What is that? That means tenancy for years. So this, this, is, like, this is like a typical lease. It has a, it has a specific starting date. It has a specific ending date. And it's a designated period. So you know it's a lease, it's an estate for years, right? Whatever the dates are. It's created by a written lease agreement and it establishes the tenant's interest in the property, but it does not convey legal title. Conveying legal title means you would be selling the property and the title goes to the new owner. That would be if you're selling it. In this case, it gives them the enjoyment for that time. You're, You're conveying that to them. Not the type. Does that make sense? Hmm. So an estate for years is like a normal lease on an apartment. A okay. normal lease on a restaurant. There's a start date. There's an end date. There's a lease written that explains everything in it. And it doesn't convey the deed. It just conveys that time period for them to use. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Estate for years. It's for years. Yeah. It's for the time period, right? Easy. Yeah. yeah. Tenancy at will. Okay, tenancy at will is like when you you don't have a lease on paper. It's like you're at will. Okay, it's either an oral agreement or an agreement with a beginning date but has no fixed term. It can be in writing. Look, you're going to move in the first of the month. It's a month to month lease. You know, every month you pay me. If you're leaving, just tell me. Right? There's no Got specific it. term. So it's at will. Tenancy at will. Right? Got it. Now there are notices to terminate it. So if it's a week to week re- rent, like if, I, if I'm going to live with you with somebody, I'm going to pay you 300 a week. You got to give them seven days notice before you stop. Got it. If it's a month to month lease, you got to give them 15 days notice. You got to know that you may see something on that, the seven day or the 15 day. If it's a tenancy, it will. How many days must you give notice? If it's a month to month lease, 15. If it's a week to week, seven, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And the last one, is called a tenancy as sufferance. Think suffer, right? It's suffering. Okay, so this is an example. Let's say you had an estate for years. You rented the property from January 1st to December 31st. Okay. Okay, the tenant stays in possession of the property behind the ending date and just keeps paying rent. It's like a tenant holdover. So you didn't talk to the landlord, nothing, but you're just still staying there and you're just paying rent. Right, you're just paying rent every month. You didn't sign a new lease, nothing. You're just staying there. Okay, when that happens, with written consent, it turns into a tenancy at will automatically. Like with the landlord, if the landlord says, "Look, you can just stay there," I'm going to put it in writing. You can just stay there. Everything's staying the same. It's just going to be month to month. Yeah. So a tenancy at sufferance is when it runs out. And it just continues. And in writing, you say, okay, you can just stay. Just stay. And that's it. 
And then what would happen is if you want to leave, you got to give them 15 days notice, right? Yeah. See, so so a tendency of sufferance is when you overstay. It's suffering, right? Think of it that way. Okay. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, no. So let's look at the different types of ownership now. So now we know you have freehold and you have leasehold, right? Freehold has fee simple estate and a life estate, yeah. right? Life estate, when it ends, it goes to a remainder man or it goes uh, in reversion, right? It goes back to whoever gave it. Leasehold estate has the three lease types of leasehold estates. You have the tenancy for or estate for years, tenancy at will, and the tenancy at sufferance, right? Tenancy for years turns into tenancy at sufferance if it overstays and in writing. So now we know all that, right? Mm -hmm. Now let's look at the top, the type of ownerships for property. Okay. Now we're going to go say, okay, it's fee simple. It's a, 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 a freehold estate. They own it. How can you own it? There's different ways to own it, right? So you could have sole ownership or you have, you could have concurrent ownership. Sole ownership is when one person or one entity owns it and concurrent is when multiple people own it, right? So there's two mm. ways, to, there's multiple ways to own property. So an estate in severality is when the title is held in one person's name. It's sole ownership. Single guy owns a house. Single woman owns a house. Estate in severality. One person owns a house in their name. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Separate property title to one spouse, either before marriage or by inheritance. Okay. That could be before marriage or inheritance or by inheritance. Now, marital assets would be acquired during a marriage. So if you're a single guy and you're married, but you buy a house in your name, it will still be marital assets. Yeah. If somebody was not married, and they had a house in their name or inherited a house before the marriage, it's not marital assets. It's their property. Yeah. Question. Go ahead. So every, every state's different with that. Just so okay. you know. Not a problem. So if, if someone buys a house, they're not married, um, that house is going to be, they're going to, they're going to own it. They're going to, own it like so they have a they're gonna have a sole ownership on that house right correct estate correct. Several. yep yes but if they um buy it as they are in a marry with somebody then would that not be in sole ownership at that point it could still be sole ownership but now it's a marital asset and the spouse has interest in it oh okay so it could be sole ownership, but it, but it, it can also be a marital asset because of correct. Okay, the marital. Okay, it will be a marital asset if you buy okay. it. Gotcha, yep. gotcha. All right. Okay. And then you have concurrent ownership. Okay, two or more persons own the property at the same time. Okay. So when you have concurrent ownership, there's three ways to own it. You have tenancy in common. Tenancy by the entireties, and you have joint tenancy. So when one person owns it, it's called a state in severality. Only way you can own it. When multiple people own it, two, three, four, five, or as many, there's three ways to hold that ownership. Tenancy in common, tenancy by the entireties, and joint tenancy. Okay? Now I'm going to go over those and what they are. Tenancy in common is concurrent ownership, two or more people. It, they can acquire the title at the same or different times. That means two people can buy the property today. Two years from now, they can bring another third partner in and split it three ways. Or they can split it half one person, quarter, quarter, right? Got it. They, they can do it however they want. It's more of a business transaction. It's more of a, a business type ownership than a per, than a, than a a couple or then a, you know, family. Now I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but it's usually used for something like that. Now there could be undivided interest in the property. One person can own 50%. 
Another one can own 25 and 25. It doesn't have to be equal. Okay. Now they can also sell it. One person can have 50, one person can have 25 and 25. This person at 25 can sell it to somebody else without their approval. Mm. Okay. Now, Got it. also in this case, the owner's heirs would inherit it, not write a survivorship. So 50%, 25, 25, the 50% guy dies. He decides who it goes to. Maybe that goes to his daughter. Now his daughter becomes her partner. It doesn't go to them. Got it. Okay. Now they can have an agreement where these two can buy them out, but they have to pay the daughter the money. There could be an agreement, but it doesn't automatically go to these people. Yeah. Okay. I had a situation where, now you can remember this. I had a married couple. The married couple were both previously married and they both had kids from their previous marriages. So they owned a bunch of properties and they had the properties owned as tenancy in common. They owned the properties 50, 50. However, when this spouse died and this, or this spouse died, their 50% was going to be split up between their kids and his 50% will be split up between his kids. Got it. See, so one would get property. One kid would get property. One, one kid would get property two, one kid would get property three. And they would be partners with whoever's on that, right? So that's yeah. what that's a case where you would do this. Or if you know three people are buying and flipping property, one guy's putting half half the money, the other two, two are putting 25%. The guy that puts half is 50%, 25, 25. Right? You would do tenants in common. That's tenancy in common. Do you understand that? Yeah, so tenants in common is it's when a property is bought by two or more people either at the same time or a later time and yep. the shares or the, the 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 property itself is going to be divided um however they choose to and, and it doesn't yeah, have to be, be equal equally or not equally right yeah they could be equal. okay got it and the biggest thing the heirs do not inherit it it's given to whoever it's willed to or i'm sorry i'm sorry the heirs do inherit it not the other owners got it the heirs yeah. inherit it and it's given through will not automatic you die it goes to them right yeah so 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 that, that kind of works the same way as like buying shares in a property i mean in a in a in a business like in stocks for example you know you, yeah, you but a stock holder. yeah but don't look at it that's totally different totally different okay. yeah, yeah yeah don't it, it the, you could look at the house as if it's a business and they're buying it you could look at it that way and they're buying a share of it okay right you could have 10 owners 10 one can own 15 Five can have 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, however, that, that's tenancy in common. Now you have tenancy by the entireties. Okay. Tenancy by the entireties is only for one type of people, married people. So to have tenancy of the entireties, you must be married. It's concurrent ownership created by a married couple only. The rule is they must be married to each other when they take title. So it can't be they're getting married and buying a house. They got to be married when they buy the house. Okay. Mm. Ten tenancy by entireties is implied if a couple is married. So that couple that I was talking about, if I wouldn't have told the title company they want to have it in tenants in common, they would have assumed and put it in tenancy by entireties automatically because they're married. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you're a married couple, they're going to assume it's going into this unless you tell them differently in the contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actions affecting the property require the consent of both spouses. So if they're going to sell it, they're going to remodel it. They're, they're going to put it on the market. You know, they're going to sell, do a contract. They're going to transfer the deed. Both spouses have to agree. Okay. When mm -hmm. one spouse dies, the ownership interest transfers to the survive, to the surviving spouse by right of survivorship automatically. So spouse dies, it goes to the other spouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in the event of divorce, tenancy of entire by entireties becomes tenancy in common. So remember, tenancy in common, you can sell your part of the house to wherever you want, right? Yeah. So I always make this joke for this. So imagine you're married. Your wife, you know, 
divorces you. She has a boyfriend. Your wife can give her boyfriend her half of the house. And you now you are now partners with her boyfriend on the house. Sounds great. <laughs> so so you can remember how it works, right? So tenancy entireties is married. Yeah. But it turns into tenancy in common if they get divorced. If they yeah. ask you that question, you know that. Why do you know that? Because she can give her half to whoever she wants. Her boyfriend. Right. Yeah. You see? Mm -hmm. so now, like, if you see something about that, you'll think of that right away, right? And now you mm -hmm. know that. So it goes to tenancy in common if they get divorced. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Now you have joint tenancy. This is the last one. Okay. Joint tenancy has the right of survivorship. Okay. Death of a co-owner, the title interest conveys to the, the to other surviving co-owners. The title does not convey to heirs. You can't give it in a will. If you're tenancy, joint tenancy, if one of the owners dies, it goes to the others. So if you have four owners, one dies, it goes to three of them. Another dies, it goes to two of them. Another dies, it goes to one of them. And then in a, then it's determined when that last one dies, who it goes to. It's determined in like an, an agreement, in the deed. Okay? Okay, specific wording in a deed must be provided for survivorship. So when the last person dies, they got to say where the house is going, where the property is going. Okay, there's four unities in joint tenancy. Okay? So if there's four owners, all four owners have undivided possession. One person can't tell somebody else they have to leave. They can all come in and go whenever they want. There's equal ownership. If it's four people, it's 25, 25, 25, 25. It can't be different. It's all equal. As one dies, it splits to three, then the 50, 50, then hundred percent, right? The title must be acquired on the same deed. Okay. So the title and the deed must all be done at the same time. You can't add people. You can't take people off. You can't do anything like that. When you buy it, that's when it's determined. The deed and the title got to match. So the day you buy it, they're the people on it. That's it. And the time they got to acquire it at the same time, the same closing, the same point. Now, if you have a property in joint tenancy and you want to sell it, refinance it, do whatever, you all have to agree. But if you want to change it and take somebody off, you all have to agree and refinance it. Or you have to agree and do any deed to get out of it. But you all have to agree. Right? You have to agree. If somebody doesn't agree, you can't change it. That's how joint tenancy works. So as long as the, let's say there's four people and they're all alive, as long as they all agree, they can they can sell the property, even if there have been some specific wording about who the property is gonna go to once they die. Well, that well, the joint well, for example, if this was like well, yeah, this would have to be a um, this would have to be a freehold estate. This would be ownership. This wouldn't be a leasehold or anything like that. Is that, is that what you're asking me? Well, I guess I guess what I'm kind of like thinking let's say that the house is inherited to these four people yep. by i mean their mother pretty much give it give it to them. Is it all four of them makes joint tenancy so they can't sell it they gotta yeah yes but then once they all die the house goes to that would be in the deed so okay. When, it, okay. when it was given to them it would say where it goes yes but then if these four people decides to sell it can they sell it Without if, they all, if they all agree, yes. Okay. Okay. Good to know. If they all they all have to agree. Okay. Okay, so that's joint tenancy. So you understand the three of those? Yes. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back. We'll start with cooperatives. Okay. Let's, um, let's come back at 12 13. I'm gonna pause the recording and we'll get started there. Sounds beautiful. Okay, so now we finished the tenancy, the joint tenancies. Um, we're going to talk about cooperatives. Now, cooperatives have their own Florida statute, and you need to know these numbers. Okay, so you have Florida statute 455, 475. Florida statute 719 regulates cooperatives. Okay, so 719 is cooperatives. Okay, now 
Cooperatives are multifamily buildings owned by corporations. The unit owners purchase shares of stock. The stock ownership entitles the purchaser to a property as a proprietary lease and right to occupy that unit. Okay, so that stock is for that unit, right? And, and that's for, they have a proprietary lease that they buy. The property taxes are assessed on each unit. Okay, the owners are able to deduct real estate taxes and mortgage interest off their taxes. Okay. The shareholders pay a pro rata share of the property taxes and the corporation pays the tax bill. So the tax bill comes, the corporation pays it, and each unit, depending on how many shares it is, pays that portion of the tax bill. These are called cooperatives. Okay. So cooperatives have disclosures and cancellation processes. So do HO, so do condominiums, so do the any kind of real estate deal book. But the disclosure and cancellation process for cooperatives go by these standards, and you need to know these. So if you're making a contract with a developer, let's say they're building the co-op, it's never been lived in before. You're buying it from a developer. If you're buying it from somebody who already owns it, that's a resale. So you, you know, you, can you understand the difference? You buy it from a developer, it's a new purchase, right? Contract with a developer. You buy it from a person, it's a resale, okay? Yeah. So when, a, when you buy a co-op from a developer, the buyer has a right to cancel within 15 calendar days of signing the contract and receipt of cooperative documents. So you sign the contract that you want to buy it. That 15-day period does not start until they give you the docs to review. That's all the rules, the regulations. Can you have a dog? You know, whatever the rules are. Mm -hmm. You have 15 days once you receive the contract signed and those documents. So if you get the contract today and you don't get the documents till next week, that 15 days doesn't start till next week. Does that make sense? Yes. If you get the contract and the docs the same day, it starts the same day. Got it. Okay. okay, so they're called cooperative documents. Now, disclosure in a resale contract when you're buying it from a person, not a, not a developer. In that case, the buyer has received the documents, which is the contract and the docs, right? So if they get the contract today and the docs don't come for a week, the three days doesn't start until they get the contract, until you sign off that they got that. So if you get it the same day, it's three days from then. So the buyers receive when the buyer receives all the documents, they have three days. Um, okay, so they receive the documents and they have three business days before signing or... The buyer has the right to cancel within three business days of signing the contract and receipt of the docs. So if you get the contract in the docs and you receive it and you look at two days in, you don't like that. I want to cancel. You get cancel, you get your money back after three days. No, you can't cancel for that anymore. Now, if a, if a, if a buyer is buying it from a resale and let's say the agent never gives you the documents and it's two days before closing. The buyer can cancel and get their money back because they have the right to get it and they have three days to review. So when you're selling a, a unit like this or a condo or any of these, you got to make sure you give them the docs and everything the same day to contract because you want that time to start during the inspection period. Got it. You, you don't want to wait to the end and then be able to get out of the deal and take the money and then your seller's mad, right? Then, or you, that, that's Remember you have to use skill, care, and diligence? Yeah. That wouldn't be skill, care, and diligence. That could be a violation of your license by doing something like that. Mm. I'm just using examples, right? So you can kind of remember. Got it. So on a co-op, three days if it's a resale, 15 days if it's a developer, right? Remember those days. You have to know those. Okay. Now let's look at a condominium. Now remember, con the co-ops have its own Florida statute, 719, all about condominium or co-ops, right? Condominiums, have its own Florida statute, 718. You got to know that. Okay. Now, condos, they consist of condo units and con common elements. Okay. A condo, a, a co-op and a condo, if you look at them, they look the same. They look, they're buildings with units in them. 
Mm. The difference is the paper, the structure, and how it's set up, right? The, the co-op is, is a proprietary lease, it's a corporation, right? A co-op, when you buy a condo, it's just like buying a house. It's a co it's, a, it's fee simple. So you get when you buy a condo, you get a fee simple deed plus an undivided fractional share of the common elements, the pool, the weight room, you know, the party rooms, all that. You get a share of that. Condos have a deed. Co-ops don't. Remember, it's a lease. So condos have a deed. of It conveys ownership, just like a house does, right? Common elements are legally attached to each unit and transfer with the unit. So in that deed, it tells you you have the right to the common elements, blah, blah, blah. Everything's in there. And when you sell that unit, that deed goes with it, and those elements go with it, right? You can't sell the condo unit, come back and use the pool, right? Got it. Goes with the deed. So, go ahead. so does that mean that when someone buys a condo, they're just buying one or multiple buildings no, inside no, they're buying, of an apartment? What no, is it? Every unit inside the condo has its own deed. Got it, got it, got it. So, so I could literally just like pay for just one of the buildings, and then I would have the deed for that building, and I would have the not the, the building, building, not the building. The building is the building. Each unit inside is a deed. Okay. Right. So when you buy a condo, you're buying unit two hundred. You get a deed for two hundred. Oh, okay. You buy okay. unit 202, you get a deed for 202. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. The building is made I, up of units. That's a good it's way to made up of a thousand units. That, that's what it is. That's what, that's what it is. That's what it is. I was thinking about, thinking about just buildings. Yeah. What is it? There's fees, there's associations, there's other fees you pay. You buy the unit, then you have a year, a monthly fee for the pool and all that. Like that's all in there. Your tax, gotcha. you still pay your taxes based on your unit. So the property taxes are levied on the unit. Remember, on the co-op, they're levied on the whole project, and then they they, they give shares, right? Yeah. That's yeah, the difference. Yeah, yeah. So a condo unit has 200 units in it. You buy one, you get a deed for that one unit. But you also get the use of all the – all 200 units get all the shared, you know, the pool, the everything, right? That's part of the deed on all of them. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Okay. And remember, 719 is for co-op, 718 is for condos. Remember that. 719 co-ops, 718 condos. Now let's talk about the condo docks. Remember you had the co-op docks and it had to be done a certain way? Condo docks have a, a different type of dock. So documents that must be given to a buyer of a new residential condo unit sold by a developer and resale purchases. So there's documents that a developer and resale both have to give. And that's these four. They got to give them a declaration of the condominium. That, that's the, the creation docs. That's the corporation docs or the LLC, whatever it is. The condo is created by recording a declaration. So that declaration has to be given as a copy. You, uh, uh, if it's a new condo, brand new or resale. The articles of incorporation for the condo association. You got to give a copy of that, new or resale. Bylaws, the operational requirements, the rules and the regulations. They got to get a copy of that, new and resale. Frequently asked question sheet. That's inf information regarding leasing the units. Can you rent them? What are the assessments? How do they figure it out? Okay, so those four things are given to a new buyer of a brand new one or a um, resale. Okay. Now, in addition, if a condo unit is sold by a developer, right? So the guy's building it and he's selling it to the person. It's not a, a third party. There's four additional documents that must be provided, okay? If the building has more than 20 units, they must give them a prospectus of what it's gonna be, what the plan is. They have to give an estimated operating budget, right? They're estimating what it's gonna cost per year to operate it. See, they don't know yet because the building's not open, right? They're building it. Mm -hmm. So they gotta give you a prospectus because they don't know exactly everything yet. They, they got to give you an estimated operating budget. It's going to be about this much to fees, right? Per square foot, whatever. The purchaser has 15 calendar days to cancel the contract after receiving the documents. Okay. Just like the co-op member was 15 days from a developer. Got it. Yeah. 
So it's 15 days from a developer on a, on a condo too. So that's the okay. same. And then three days for a resale. Right. And it's the same. It's the same on a condo too. It's how okay. you're So you got to remember that. Now, after signing the contract, they have 15 days to cancel. However, that clock does not begin until the buyer receives the required condo docs too, just like the co-op. So if you get right. the contract, but you don't get the docs till two weeks later, it doesn't start till then. If you never give them the docs and they ask you two days before closing, they come back out of that deal. Mm. Okay. And get their money back. So you yeah. have to make sure everything's given to them and it's documented. There's a form. They, when they receive the docs, they signed a form when they received it. So you have it in the file. Right? Mm, I was about to say, I was about to wonder how that works. Everything's documented. Everything, man. Okay. Now let's talk about resale of the units. That was that that was the construct. That was the new development, right? Let's talk about resale. So remember, you had those four primary documents, the articles and all that for both. When it's a resale, there's those four documents plus these three. Now, when the building's open, it's operating. There's no prospectus. There's no estimated budget. You have a budget, right? So you have to give the most recent end of year financial information. So their financial statement for the end of the uh, end of last year, you have to give them. The rules of the association, you have to give them. And the governance form. There's no governance form on a new development because there isn't a government's board yet. You know, who the yeah. president, vice president, you, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So if you see that in a question, you know it can't be in a development because it has it's not it's not it's not built yet. Got it. Right. So common sense tells you it has to be a resale, right? So if they try to trick you, you got to think like that, okay? Got it. You have three business days to cancel the contract, and that's after signing the contract and receiving the docs. So on, on condos and co-ops, it's 15 days developer, three days resale on mm -hmm. both, mm -hmm. okay? 719 Florida statute for co-ops, 718 for condos, right? For condos. Yep. Now let's talk about timeshares. Timeshares have their own Florida statute, <laughs> 721. So 18's condos, 19's co-ops, 21 is timeshares. Okay. Now timeshares, units are divided into time segments of ownership and they're 52 weeks usually. So each week is a time period that is sold. Okay, there's deeds or other ownership evidences are prepared for each ownership segment. So literally one unit has 52 deeds and each deed is sold for that week. Okay. Now let's talk about the timeshare licensure requirement. Okay. Real estate, like uh, real estate license is required to sell another timeshare for compensation. So you have to have a license to sell it. Now there's an exemption. Remember when it's a developer, and remember when it's a property manager under certain circumstances, if you work for a timeshare company and you're salaried, okay, you're a salaried employee of a timeshare developer selling timeshares for that developer, provided you're not paid a commission and you're not based on transactions, you don't need a license. Mm -hmm. And owners of timeshares can sell their own timeshares. Like an owner of a house can sell their own house, right? Yep. yep. It's the same. Okay. So you have that exception there. If it's salary and no commission and no base on transaction, okay? Got it. So let's look at the timeshare resale listing agreements. What goes on those? Okay. It's illegal to connect, collect an advance fee on for a listing a timeshare. Can't do it. It's required disclosure, not guaranteeing a sale. You must require them that you cannot promise them a sale. Can't guarantee it. Other requirements that must be on the agreement is commissions, like what you're charging, your fees, the terms of the agreement, the broker services, what the broker's doing, termination and listing extension rights, like if it, if it expires or if they want to extend it, it has to be explained how, and if there's any judgments or litigation against the broker how that would be worked out or any problems, like if there, if it would be arbitration or things like that, right? Let's talk about a sales contract disclosure, okay? Timeshare sales contract must contain the current year's timeshare assessment. If there's, if the property taxes, um, 
include or, or not included in the assessment, and also the most recent property tax assessment. They must be in with the contract. Okay, the form of the timeshare ownership, how they're owning it, the managing entity, who's, who's the management company for the timeshare, the terms for closing and the cost to close it, and the existing of the mandatory exchange program. A lot of timeshares you buy here, but you can go around the world, right? You could, you could trade your weeks and things. You have to let them know it all has to be in the contract. Now, the right of cancellation. Remember, you have three days for, for uh, resale, 10 days for develop, 15 days for developer on co-ops mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, condos. Mm -hmm. However, it's different on a timeshare. The buyer has the right to cancel within 10 days of signing the timeshare contract or receipt of the public offering statement, whichever occurs later. So it's 10 days. That's for a new development and a resale. So there's no three and 10, three and 15. It's just 10. Okay. 10 days on a timeshare, no matter what. And you get the public offering statement um, and the contract. So you got to have both of them. If they don't give you both of them, it doesn't start the time period. Okay. So let's look at timeshare ownership. There's different ways to own this. You have interval ownership. That's fee simple ownership and the fractional interest is transferred by the deed. So you, that week is yours. You own it, you can sell it, do what you want with it, right? Fee simple. Then you also have right to use timeshares. This is where you have usage of timeshare is limited to a certain number of years. Usually a timeshare is like 50 years. You buy it, you pay for it, you pay the fees, you have it 50 years, and then after 50 years, it goes back to the developer. That's usually how that works. It's called owner, ownership, it remains with the developer. And that's a right to use. So if you get a fee simple one, it's yours forever. Do what you want with it. If you have a right to use timeshare, that's usually a time, it's, it's like a leasehold estate kind of, but they don't call it that. You have it for so long and it goes back. So that, that's the two types of ownerships, okay? Got it. Now let's review. This is very important. You got to know this. Review of rescission periods. Okay. You have the cooperative, condominium, and timeshare rescission periods. What's three business days? That's a resale of a residential co-op and condo unit, right? Three days resale condo and co-op. 10 days is a timeshare sold by a developer or a resale. That's your time to cancel. And 15 calendar days is a residential co-op or condo by a developer. So if you're buying a new one from a developer, 15 days. Good on that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Now this ends chapter eight. You'll have, like I said, you're going to have eight questions. 8% of the test is covered on the, on this section.